the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit, your often bi-weekly podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeal. I'm your host, John Ross, joined this week by Dan Albin and Diana Simpson, two attorneys at IJ. Dan, let's start things off in the Third Circuit with the TSA screeners case. Sure. So this case is uh, Pellegrino v. TSA. It involves uh, sort of a classic situation of a passenger getting upset about uh, how they're being searched by TSA screeners. In this case, um, I'm not going to go into all of the facts because there's this long convoluted description of the various um, offenses that both the passenger and the screeners take at each other's actions. But at the end of the day, the passenger files a lawsuit against these TSA screeners, alleging that they violated her rights in in various ways. And uh, the court is trying to determine whether or not um, TSA officers, TSA transportation screening, transportation security officers, TSOs, are law enforcement officers who are liable under the Federal Tort Claims Act. And the circuit, the Third Circuit decided two to one that uh, TSA screeners, these TSOs, are not, in fact, law enforcement officers for purposes of the Federal Tort Claims Act and are thus immune from uh, liability for these sorts of lawsuits. Uh, For a lot of people, I think this is a a pretty shocking result. This follows up on a case um, last year that the Third Circuit decided, uh, also finding that the same TSA screeners are immune from Bivens actions, which is a a type of lawsuit that you can bring when your your rights are violated by an individual uh, government employee. And so in the Third Circuit, at least, um, there is a broad immunity for for TSA screeners now. Well, let's just real briefly go back to the facts, because there are some interesting things going on there. Diana? Yeah. So what's interesting here is that basically this woman named Nadine Pellegrino was was going through the airport with her husband, and she gets into a bit of a tiff with the agents. She goes through the metal detector. It alerts, so they pull her over for special screening, and then she's not happy with how they're screening her, and so they take her into a private room to conduct a more thorough screening, um, which you always, I think, want to avoid as a general pro tip for your time in the airport. Um, So she goes into this special room. They go through all of her things. They don't find anything. um, And so then they say that she's free to go. So she goes to take her bags and her shoes. She has to repack everything. And she goes to take them back out. And she throws her shoes outside the room, takes her bag. And these items hit the a couple of the officers on their way out. Allegedly. And so she... Um, they decide that they need to arrest her. Um, they they wanted to file a file charges against her because she um, battered them with her bag and her shoes. And so they go to do that. Uh, she is then arrested and then held on bond, or she, she's re- released after 18 hours of being held on bond and then charged with 10 different crimes. Um, by the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. Two counts each of felony aggravated assault, possession of instruments of a crime, reckless endangerment, and making terroristic threats. She is then, um, this matter goes to trial, and she is ultimately acquitted. Um, But she was charged with 10 crimes for basically getting into an argument with TSA, and these are pretty serious crimes, most of which I think are a felony. And I think she wasn't even charged with the crimes until after she started filing the reports and complaining to superiors about what was going on. I think that was sort of what triggered uh, these charges. And the opinion notes, and I don't remember now if it's the dissenting opinion or the, the majority, but it doesn't matter all that much, uh, notes that basically these uh, the Philadelphia DA's office uh, must have engaged, must have taken some sort of creative charging uh, course in law school, being able to come up with 10 different charges based on someone possibly having hit someone with luggage while taking it off of a screening table. This is the great quote from the dissent. Someone must have taken creative charging and aced the test. Either that or there was a lot of lawyer lounge temporizing. (laughs) And to be clear, she didn't just uh, lose her temper. She alleges that, you know, the TSA agents were like going through her things and then putting them back, like spilling things in her bag, basically. They, they, They ruined her makeup. They damaged her eyeglasses, um, according to her anyway. And so for this, she gets charged with, uh, what did you say? It was possessing instruments of a crime, which in this case is her bags. Yeah, and she ultimately uh, ended up um, 
filing a claim saying that the TSOs had um, caused damages of about $950,000. So that's what ultimately turns into this lawsuit. Yeah, the the underlying facts of the case are quite a mess, and and reading them, it's really hard to make out um, what happened at all. There, there's quite a bit of dispute about it. But at the end of the day, um, they hassled this lady a lot. She was upset by it. Um, then when she reported it, she got charged with ten crimes by the Philadelphia DA, and um, you know the the dissent obviously makes a big point about that. But I think uh, probably the most damning part of the opinion is actually from the majority opinion, where they're deciding whether or not these TSOs are, in fact, law enforcement officers or not. And they're looking at, they look at whether they're considered law enforcement officers under the organic statute for the TSA. And as it turns out, uh, TSA has some employees who are law enforcement officers, but they're very few and it has some employees who are not considered to be law enforcement officers under TSA's organic statute, including TSA screeners. So TSA does not consider itself generally a law enforcement organization, and it does not consider its screeners to be law enforcement officers who have law enforcement authority. But that doesn't resolve whether they are law enforcement officers for the purposes of the Federal Tort Claims Act, which is a separate statute that was passed to give people remedies when uh, their homes are searched or their persons are searched and ransacked by federal officers, which is kind of what happened to this lady uh, at the airport. And the the majority opinion compares uh, TSA officers to administrative inspectors conducting administrative inspections and most tellingly to FDA inspectors conducting meat inspections, which if anyone has had uh, the new enhanced screening uh, pat-downs at the airport, you might uh, see the comparison between uh, FDA meat inspectors and TSA screeners. Yeah, and and so what I one of the things I found interesting here is that the that Nadine Pellegrino and her husband um, were proceeding pro se; they were representing themselves, and so the court had appointed an amicus to argue, I think, the finer points of um, the law here. And so the amicus's argument was basically that these screenings are the same thing as searches, and so anyone who was authorized to search is a law enforcement officer. Um, subject to this sovereign immunity waiver. And the government's argument was basically that only traditional law enforcement officers, i.e. those who possess criminal justice powers, are law enforcement officers. And so the Third Circuit agreed with the government. And and I think that that really just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense for anyone who has ever flown or experienced any kind of TSA search it really feels a lot more like you're encountering a police officer as you would any other place in society, and you're undergoing a search that is a it feels like a criminal search, and it just it feels a lot more like you're inter, you're engaging with a cop than you might be engaging with a um, Department of Agriculture inspector. Yeah, and and in fact, it has criminal consequences as the as the dissent points out. I mean, I think the dissent gets the much better uh, part of, of the argument here. I mean, TSA officers uh, wear uniforms with badges that declare themselves to be officers. They look like law enforcement officers. They they have the same authority that law enforcement officers have with respect to searching people, uh, right down to a pat-down that looks basically like the same sort of pat-down you'd get during a, a Terry stop. Um, you know, they're authorized to go through your bags. They're authorized to detain contraband if it's if they find contraband in your luggage or on your person. And, you know, they their authority to actually arrest and prosecute people is somewhat limited, but they can certainly detain them uh, until other law enforcement officers arrive. Uh, it's a real stretch to say that these folks aren't law enforcement officers uh, who have the, the power to search people when, in fact, that is their very job. They exist to search people before they board airplanes. And the idea that they're the same as some sort of administrative meat inspector, uh, while deeply insulting, of course, to passengers, is also just rather absurd, uh, considering the very purposes of the Fourth Amendment to protect um, you know, one's persons and effects from unreasonable searches. And the decision creates a circuit split, does it not, Dan? Well, it certainly seems to. The dissent indicates that, um, you know, the Seventh Circuit and the D.C. Circuit have have come out differently on this issue. And I think it does set up uh, a potential for uh, a cert petition. And uh, as Diana mentioned, uh, these folks are unrepresented and might uh, 
might be well represented by uh, counsel uh, trying to seek cert by the U.S. Supreme Court to straighten out this issue, because um, there is, uh, you know, a lot of questions about the extent to which uh, these TSA screeners are liable for whatever they do to passengers, either under Bivens or under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Okay, and let's move on to the next case, which comes from the Iowa Supreme Court. Diana? Yeah, so this case involves a guy named Ingram who gets pulled over on the morning of October 30th, 2015, because his license plate was not illuminated as required. Um, So in the course of pulling him over, the officer realizes that the vehicle's registration sticker doesn't match the license plate um, and that it had actually expired in 2013. So the officer decides to impound the vehicle um, and does not arrest Ingram, but has him sit in the patrol vehicle while he writes out the citations. So Ingram decided he, I mean, he was headed to work, so he wanted to get his work items from the car and then have a friend take him to his his workplace. Um, and so in the process of this, the officer decides to do a, he asks Ingram if there's anything of value in the vehicle and um, decides to inventory the contents of the vehicle. So they're going through, the U.S. Supreme Court has decided that that inventories of cars are perfectly authorized. You don't need to have a warrant to do so. Um, and so they're, they're going through the car and they discover a black cloth bag on the floor next to the gas pedal. Um, inside this, this cloth bag ends up being a glass pipe and about a gram of methamphetamine. Um, and so they charge him with uh, possession of methamphetamine and they charge him with possession of drug paraphernalia. He moves to suppress this, saying that this is an unconstitutional search. Um, and this case is really cool because the Iowa Supreme Court basically says – our version of the Fourth Amendment is much strong, offers much stronger protections than what the U.S. Supreme Court has recognized that the U.S. Constitution offers. Um, and so they they grant the motion to suppress. And it's it's just a really, really neat decision talking about the differences between US con- the U.S. Constitution and all the different state constitutions. Yeah. And so, you know, this case is about a pretty obnoxious exception that's been created to the Fourth Amendment where... Anytime uh, the police seize or impound a car for any reason, they conduct this uh, this search of a vehicle in order to inventory the contents. Now, none of that is necessary at all. They could just impound the vehicle and seal it, and whatever is in the vehicle would not need to be inventoried. They claim they need to do it in case something goes missing, etc. But again, if you seal the vehicle upon impounding it, there's no need for any of this. But of course, all of this is being driven by the war on drugs and the desire to search everything and everybody and the courts, the federal court's willingness to just uh, bend over backwards for any sort of police power. But I think there's a, a pretty powerful um, part of the, of the opinion that's uh, actually just the second paragraph of the opinion explaining what's going on here. And I just wanted to read uh, a little bit from it because I think it sort of uh, explains what's at stake. The court says, we accept the invitation to restore the balance between citizens and law enforcement by adopting a tighter legal framework for warrantless inventory searches and seizures of automobiles under Article 1, Section 8 of the Iowa Constitution than provided under the recent precedents of the United States Supreme Court. In doing so, we encourage stability and finality in law by decoupling Iowa law from the winding and often surprising decisions of the United States Supreme Court. In the words of another state Supreme Court, we do not allow the words of our Iowa Constitution to be, quote, balloons to be blown up or deflated every time and precisely in accord with the interpretation of the U.S. Supreme Court following some torturous trial. That's citing a Mississippi decision called Pennock v. State. We take the opportunity to stake out higher constitutional ground today. And that's sort of what the opinion is about, that the the Iowa uh, Article One, Section Eight, which is which is their version of what we would call the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. Constitution, uh, is stronger and has and is being interpreted more strictly than what the federal courts have done, chipping away at the Fourth Amendment. 
And this is a, a really good um, discussion, an example, really, of why you should be looking to state constitutions when you're engaging in constitutional litigation throughout the country. Um, you know, the U.S. Constitution, as wonderful a document as it is, has been narrowed in interpretation by the federal courts for as long as it's been in existence, essentially. And state Supreme Courts are a, another opportunity to invoke the different constitutional protections and say, well, even if the U.S. Supreme Court was wrong in this issue, interpret your own constitutional provisions independently. And let's come to a more reasoned discussion and a more reasoned place of what a constitutional provision means and what kinds of things it protects. And so this is something we at IJ have been doing uh, for many years. And and I think a lot of other uh, public interest firms are are doing as well. And, and it's it's important because just because the federal constitution is the one that most people talk about doesn't mean that it's the most protective one. And, you know, I think each state is different. Each state approaches um, both the law independently and each state approaches policy issues independently. And so this is a good opportunity to go through and get better protections for your clients. And this is something we've encountered uh, in our own practice quite frequently, as Diana mentioned. I mean, we've we've brought a number of cases under state law constitutional provisions to vindicate those provisions or show that they're stronger than than federal court provisions. But one recent example on the Fourth Amendment is in our recent Wyoming forfeiture case. Uh, Wyoming's law on search and seizure, and particularly on how long a motorist may be detained and questioned, and what constitutes turning a uh, a simple a highway stop and and questioning for a ticket into a drug interrogation. Um, I, uh, Wyoming law is far more protective than uh, United States constitutional law because the Wyoming Constitution has been interpreted uh, more strictly by the Wyoming Supreme Court uh, than the United States Supreme Court has done uh, with the Fourth Amendment. And so, you know, that was an example where we we brought claims under the Wyoming Constitution that likely would not have been winners uh, under under U.S. Uh, Fourth Amendment case law. And the court uh, points out, and this is sort of a, a practitioner's note here, the, the court points out, it would amount to malpractice for lawyers not to understand the potential for an independent state court interpretation under the state constitution that is more protective of individual rights. And I think this is something that attorneys, especially folks who have kind of a national practice or focus on on federal issues more, uh, can easily overlook. They're they're thinking about you know the big U.S. constitutional issues. When you take constitutional law in law school, you're usually not looking at state constitutions. You're looking at the federal constitution. But in many cases, there are similar or sometimes uh, even more strongly worded provisions in state constitutions. And state supreme courts often have, um, I'm going to say, a more uh, practical and uh, literal interpretation of those words than the supreme court, which often uh, departs from the language of the Constitution as well as its uh, intention. Now, I will say that the that this was not a unanimous decision in terms of approach. And so this was a unanimous decision in, in granting the motion to suppress. But there was a separate concurrence by Justice Mansfield that was joined by two other justices of the Iowa Supreme Court basically saying, uh, this is not the time to branch out and provide extra protection under the Iowa Supreme Court because this particular inventory search was unconstitutional even under Wells, which is the the United States Supreme Court decision um, kind of overriding all of this. And so it's unconstitutional under Wells, so we don't even need to talk about the Iowa Constitution. And, you know, I, I think we've seen a lot of state Supreme Courts doing things like that, where it's like, well, you know, if, if there's a way that we can stretch this to to reach the result intended under the U.S. Constitution, we're not going to, to reach the question of whether the state Supreme Court offers or whether the state Constitution offers greater protections, because it is um, a whole new world when you do that. Yeah. And so the majority opinion... Um sort of addresses that, uh, it addresses it directly at some points, but rather obliquely in others. And what it says sort of in summarizing um, this is uh, it talks about how they've repeatedly declined to follow the approach of the U.S. Supreme Court in in, in its interpretation of what one commentator has referred to as an ever-shrinking uh, Fourth Amendment. And I think that's really what's at issue in this case. Um, the majority of the, of the Iowa Supreme Court does not like this chipping away at um, protections against unreasonable search and seizure, and they're not going to allow the Iowa Constitution's protection against that to be shrunk uh, 
in the same way that the Supreme Court has done with the Fourth Amendment. Yeah. And so the Iowa Supreme Court here, you know, kind of makes fun of the idea of getting pulled over anyway. And, and not, not, it, it's not a light making fun of. It's a pretty serious point that you can get pulled over for just about anything, just about any time. I mean, there are so many different laws that regulate your ability to drive. And often people get pulled over for um, not necessarily real reasons about public health and safety. And so the Iowa Supreme Court points to that. And then they point to this, this whole notion of inventory searches that none of this is really to protect public health and safety. It's not to protect the driver. It's really just a tool for law enforcement to increase their crime fighting ability. And the Iowa Supreme Court says that the Iowa Constitution just does not allow that. And and we encounter these bogus um, reasons for pulling people over on the highway all the time. We have we've had clients um, pulled over for having a broken taillight that magically fixed itself after the stop. Uh, people are pulled over for driving too fast, driving too slow, suspiciously driving at exactly the speed limit. And even if they don't actually seize and impound your vehicle, they can still search your vehicle. Um, you know, a lot of people foolishly consent to the search. But even if they don't, um, very often there's a drug dog on the scene. They have the they have the dog sniff the vehicle. And lo and behold, it alerts because, uh, you know, these drug sniffing dogs are basically probable cause machines designed to generate probable cause to justify a search without a warrant. And so, you know, if the police want to search your car, uh, they have so many different tools to do so because the Fourth Amendment has been so badly eroded. Okay, and with that, let's move on to the last case, which comes out of the D.C. Circuit. Diana? Yeah, so this case is called the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and Maya Von Russum versus the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And so this particular case involves, I'm just going to call it FERC, um, it involves the ability ability of people to um, construct facilities to transport natural gas in interstate commerce. And so basically what you have to do if you want to do that is um, get a certificate of public convenience and necessity. So you basically have to ask the government's permission and prove that this particular pipeline is going to be necessary. Um, And so FERC, the way that it's funded, it gets appropriation money from the federal government On top of that, it also gets fees um, from the regulated industries. And so the the underlying facts here involve the Penn East Pipeline Company, which sought one of these certificates of necessity to build a pipeline through Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, And so Riverkeeper, which is this environmental group, intervened to oppose the pipeline. Um, And so while that proposal was was being reviewed, Riverkeeper then filed a complaint, filed a separate action asking um, the courts to basically strike down the entire funding structure of FERC, saying that the way that FERC is funded creates bias by incentivizing them to approve new pipelines so that they get more fees um, for their their organization and their running. Um, and so the court goes through basically it first starts with whether there's a property interest at all, whether Riverkeeper can um, identify a due process interest under either the liberty, um, under either a liberty interest or a property interest under the due process clause. And basically, the answer to that is no. Um, There's no liberty interest because it's not the same thing as a normal liberty interest, which is about the right of the individual to contract and to engage in an occupation and those kinds of things. Um, And basically, the the court says that just doesn't apply here. and then there's also no due, uh, due process right for a property right here because there's really just no ability to exclude. It's not a traditional property right in the sense that, you know, owning your own property is where you can kick people out of it. Um, and so the, because there's no due process right, there it's it's really just they, they can't seek it that way. Um, so the the environmental rights amendment under the pennsylvania courts just doesn't create this this protected interest so FERC can't infringe it um so that claim is gone and then they address this other claim about funding which is the much more interesting claim yeah and so this is a claim about what the court calls structural bias the structural bias of an adjudicator um and it's it's brought under uh marshall v jericho which uh, has held that, uh, and the Supreme Court held that uh, due process requires an impartial and disinterested uh, adjudicator. And so the plaintiffs uh, in this case sort of point out, look, 
FERC, they do receive annual appropriations from Congress, but uh, those appropriations, they're, they're basically required um, by statute to uh, collect as many fees as, uh, as they spend and, and essentially be kind of cost neutral with respect to the congressional budget. And so the, the concern is this is going to encourage FERC, the, the, the structure here, is going to encourage FERC to impo impose more fines and fees in order to remain uh, sort of budget neutral or, or an agency that, that recovers its own costs. Um, and so the court sort of takes a look at this and the three uh, leading cases on this, which are all uh, cases involving mayor's courts, uh, something that um, has been litigated extensively in Ohio. And there, there's th sort of three leading cases on this, Toomey, Dugan, and Ward v. Village of Monroeville. And they all involve a mayor that has some role in uh, a court in, in his uh, town. And in each of the each of the three cases, the mayor has different levels of um, uh, authority over how the town's budget is spent and also has different levels of personal financial interest in any fines and fees that are collected. So in Toomey, the, the mayor actually, uh, a portion of his salary is funded directly by uh, the fines and fees that he imposes as part of the court. And uh, he is also um, someone who has significant control over the budget of the city. And so in that case, uh, it was found to violate due process because uh, the mayor is, you know, essentially deciding what his own salary is going to be by imposing fines and fees. In contrast, in Dugan v. Ohio, uh, the mayor was one of five members of a city commission. Um, the fines did not go directly to his salary. They were deposited in the city general fund. The mayor's salary was paid out of that fund, but the court found that the, the mayor's salary was not directly connected in any way to how much uh, was collected uh, in these fines and fees. And then Ward v. Millage Monroeville, a much later case from 19... Those are cases from the 1920s. Uh, Ward v. Millage of Monroeville is a case from 1972 where uh, the mayor sort of had... Um, it was kind of a mix of the of the two cases. Um, the salary wasn't dependent on fines from convictions, but a huge percentage of the city's budget was dependent on uh, the fines and fees that were collected through this municipal court, and the court found that was um, impermissible. The D.C. Circuit takes a look at these three cases and says this case is most similar to Dugan because um, the FERC commissioners uh, first of all, don't really have much control over their own budget. They're, they don't sit on Congress. Congress controls their budget. And uh, the FERC commissioners' uh, salaries and other things aren't directly affected uh, by any of this. And so um, regardless of how many pipelines FERC approves or charges for uh, and collects fees for, it's not going to affect the, you know, the bottom line financial conditions for either the FERC commissioners or uh, at least immediately is not going to affect um, FERC's budget. Of course, they kind of sidestep the fact that FERC's budget is supposed to be uh, budget neutral with respect to Congress. And so um, there is a, a little bit of wiggle room in the opinion on that. So the Ohio cases feel a bit different because the, the fines and fees being imposed are, you know, probably on motorists and regular people and the money is going straight to the city. This case, it's more like a regulated entity, all of whom are pretty well funded if you're going to build a pipeline and it the money's going to an administrative agency's coffers so it seems like if the environmentalists win here it's like you couldn't have a state board for dentists because dentists pay a hundred dollars a year for their for their license or something like there, there's a real difference between kind of imposing criminal penalties and that going to the to the public fisc um and kind of this administrative stuff. That's how it feels to me. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, and, and it, it to the extent that any regulated entity couldn't, um, or any regulator, I guess, couldn't take money and take money from the people who are regulated and then just ha operate in a budget neutral way, um, you know, that seems unlikely to go because there are so many regulators who are funded in this in this way, exactly like you said, the, the dental board, the uh, attorneys boards, for instance, throughout the throughout the country. And I'll, I'll just point out that importantly, and, and the court uh, points this out, importantly, the, the money does not go directly to FERC. It, it may go through FERC, but ultimately it's deposited in the U.S. Treasury. And so 
um, one of the key distinctions the the court draws here is, um, look, this this isn't money that that's going directly to FERC. FERC isn't directly financially motivated by this. Yes, there may be some budget offset or something like that, but ultimately that's decided by Congress, and it doesn't have to be the case going forward. That's for Congress to decide. Um, you know, the money goes to the general fund of the United States, the the Treasury fund, and and not uh, back to FERC. And that's actually very different. Uh, from a lot of the the forfeiture cases that we litigate, where the money actually does go back to the law enforcement agency that is seizing the property, and the concern is this creates an impermissible bias, um, a, a, an incentive to police for profit, because the money that you the money or uh, property or whatever else that you seize as a law enforcement agency goes to an off budget slush fund that can only be spent on law enforcement purposes. Often those purposes include things like salaries, overtime, and other benefits and goodies uh, for law enforcement officers. And so there is a strong incentive to, um, you know, conduct more seizures and forfeitures than than one might otherwise. And that that does violate um, the the instruction of Marshall v. Jericho that a uh, there must be an impartial and disinterested um, adjudicator as well as um, prosecutorial f- functions. And I think it's also different from the cases where we've sued get sued localities over fines and fees, because those those um, localities are much more similar to the Ward v. Village of Monroeville case, where a large percentage of their budget is derived from these fines and fees that are being imposed on motorists or people with cracked driveways or some other minor violation. And the court also distinguishes this case from from those because you know the the fees collected by FERC make up a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the federal budget, and it is not as though the federal government is is somehow going to run out of money if FERC stops collecting pipeline fees. It just has it's a drop in the bucket and has no um, real bearing on the ability of the government to keep operating. Whereas for many of these cities, if as much as twenty percent of your budget is dependent on uh, fines and fees, uh, you had better get out there every single day and, and you know, ticket as many people as you can, or else you might lose your job, your friends might lose their jobs, you know, all kinds of important city functions might not happen if you've decided to structure your city's finances in that way. Yeah, and I, I think one of the other factors, like in, in addition to the to the general fund part of it, I think another one of the important factors to the court is that the FERC's amount of money they can collect is capped. And so they are not allowed by statute to to acquire any extra money and they're not allowed to spend any extra money. And so whatever Congress says they're allowed to spend, that's what they're allowed to spend. Whatever Congress says they're allowed to get back in terms of fees, that's it. And so they they can't really expand their their workload or expand you know what they're doing based on these fees. They they have to go to Congress just like everybody else and say, "Please, sir, can I have some more?" Um, and only then can they expand it. And so the the incentive motivation here really is really cut off because it, it is controlled by Congress in so many different ways. And the, the revenue neutral uh, sort of aspect of this um, has some relevance to another decision that's actually pending right now before the D.C. Circuit. Um, the challenge to the the P10 fees uh, imposed by the IRS, the the IRS maintains that these fees, which is a fees for an identification number issued to tax preparers, they they claim it's a user fee, and user fees have to be cost neutral in the sense that you're just recovering the costs for whatever user benefit you're granting. And all of the plaintiffs, it's a class action, all of the tax preparer plaintiffs challenge that, saying, look, there's no advantage to us. We don't get any benefit from these user fees that you're imposing on us. The The only benefit is is to the federal government to keep track of us and, and to the IRS specifically. And um, it turns out that the IRS has probably overcharged these tax preparers um, by a substantial margin. The, the, the fees imposed are significantly greater than the actual cost of administering the system, regardless of who wins that initial dispute. And it seems very likely that the IRS is going to have to disgorge uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to these tax preparers because it did not collect these fees in a budget-neutral way. It actually profited from uh, the fees that it was charging. And just a year into the program, I think, had uh, brought in more than a hundred million dollars, but had only spent fifty million dollars. So it was it was turning over a a significant uh, profit. 
And that's not what federal agencies are supposed to be in the business of doing. So that's sort of an out of control um, uh, federal program that that I think the D.C. Circuit is probably going to nip in the bud. Uh, here, there are cost controls and there are uh, ways of keeping it revenue neutral. OK, that concludes the show. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you. Until next time, this is John Ross from the Institute for Justice, longing for you to get engaged. Thank you.